Hi. Um, very happy to be here. Can you hear me all right? The, the story today um, centers around some remarkable people, um, three remarkable women and um, probably more than that in the grand scheme, and some remarkable men. Um, this is the big house at Melrose Plantation. Uh, Melrose Plantation was founded by um, the son of Marie Therese Quanquan, who was a, a, a slave who uh, had a 19-year relationship with a Frenchman uh, who eventually uh, purchased her freedom and the freedom of some of her children. She got an annual stipend and a piece of land, and she was an amazing businesswoman and um, acquired a great deal more land over the years. She um, Eventually, he broke up with her and married an, another woman as his reputation um, increased in the town. Um, she, Marie Therese was born in 1746. And she was born a slave into the household of the founder of Natchitoches, which is spelled Natchitoches, but it's pronounced Natchitoches. Um, this is all in the Cane River region of, um, of Louisiana. And her son, Louis uh, Metoyer, uh, got this land. He got 991 acres, um, and he established Melrose Plantation. Uh, the, this big house, he started the construction in 1932, and uh, it was continued by his son. Um, the, her children, you know, uh, developed a lot of property in the area, had different plantations, and, um, and, and it remained in the family um, from 1796 to 1884. The, there, were a lot of, there were a number of terrible droughts. Um, the plantation had um, a lot of different things over the years, a um, little bit of tobacco, maybe a little bit of indigo, um, always pecan trees. And um, it was briefly owned by the Herzog family. Um, they bought it for a pittance, and then it was sold to the, um, to the Henry family in, um, in 1899. And John Henry and his wife, uh, Carmelite, she was known as Cammy, um, lived there and just did a lot of work improving the house. They added two towers at either end of the home. And, um, and John Henry only lived there for uh, 20 years, and he died. Well, Cammy Henry was the second remarkable woman. She continued the farm after her husband died, and she started an artist colony. She was incredibly interested in the, the local folk arts, weaving, and um, she apparently collected log cabins, and she made elaborate scrapbooks. And she um, invited really important and not so important painters and writers to come and stay with her for extended periods, and it was this amazing, lively place. Um, this is one of the early buildings from the plantation. Um, the estimated date is about 1810. This was probably the original colonial home on the plantation. It predates the big house. And this is a really enigmatic and wonderful structure on the property, probably built between 1820 and 1830. And um, it's just unique in its materials and design. And um, we're going to be talking more about that as we go along. Here's just a little bit more. Um, there, there's a, there's a, a thing called a Creole cottage, which is a part of, important part of the vernacular of the area. But, but Africa House has this remarkable freestanding roof. Um, there, there was not clear evidence that there were ever any posts, but... Um, it's just, it's this structure that defies logic and gravity, and everyone's kind of compelled by it. So enter the picture um, back, Clementine Hunter, who um, was born uh, in a family of sharecroppers in 1887, and she moved to Melrose Plantation at, as, at age 12. And her family worked um, picking cotton. She worked in the fields and um, attended school for one year, but she didn't like it. 
She kept running away from school and, and said that she preferred picking cotton to the, the sort of confining structure of the schoolroom. And um, she, she, was a, she was a field hand, she was a maid in the house, and eventually she became a cook. And somewhere along the way, one of the guests at the house, whose name was Alberta Kinsey, left some paints behind. And in 1938, that's the earliest date we know, um, Clementine made some paintings. She started to experiment. In 1939, um, one of the remarkable men in the story shows up, and this is Francois Mignon. He was um, a gentleman who came from New York for a visit. Cammie Henry wrote him and said, oh, please come back and, and for a longer stay. And um, so he stayed from 1939 to 1970. He really liked it. And um, Francois was an, a writer. He wrote about gardens and um, local culture, and he was uh, quite the raconteur. They um, discovered over the years, I mean, this story sort of, sort of grew that, that he was Francois Mignon from Paris, and that he knew everything about French culture, and, and so he sort of let this story grow. Um, the wonderful thing about Louisiana and, and a lot of traditions there is that they're oral traditions, and um, nobody will let a good story get in the way of the facts. And this is what we have sort of encountered throughout our research on Clementine Hunter, is the remarkable people that tell the stories and the remarkable stories, and we get a little hung up trying to separate the facts, but it's not that much fun. Um, so Francois um, is very intrigued by Clementine, who's a good cook, and she brings him some paintings, and, and he decides she's a fabulous painter. Um, they, I guess they become close, and Francois writes about her. I think he was really a critical piece of the story in, in getting her recognition, and... Um, and getting the plantation recognition and, and getting recognition for himself. Um, the curious thing is he was almost legally blind and he wrote about gardens and art. But um, here they are together. Um, Francois became sort of her agent and people that came to the, to the plantation to visit would, uh, would have to go through Francois. Clementine didn't really want to mess with visitors too much. This is the cover of a book um, up here. I don't know if you can read it, but it says 25 cents to look. Well, up here it says 25 cents to look, and then she changed it to 50 cents to look. Um, and one of the anecdotes is, you know, people would drive up and, and ask for direction to Clementine Hunter's house, and she would send them down the road. But this is the cover of a wonderful book by Art Shiver and Tom Whitehead, who... Um, I mean, Tom White has, these are two more remarkable people in the story because um, Tom um, moved to the area, uh, I think in the 60s, and befriended Clementine, and uh, he was a teacher at Northwestern University, which is the university in Natchitoches, and every time he went, he'd buy a painting, and the prices of her work used to vary from 25 cents to, I think, $5, and um, he, he acquired her work, and he visited her every week throughout the, the re remainder of her life and uh, has done amazing original research um, looking at Francois Mignon's notebooks. Francois kept a, a journal, and apparently there are 17,000 pages of journal that are now in an archives, thank goodness, and uh, Tommy and Art have done a lot of original research in that archives. So... This is, this is the little building African house um, as it looks today. Um, it got shored up with some supports uh, a few years ago. And in 1955, uh, Francois had this idea that, um, that Clementine should do some murals in the upstairs of African house, which had been used for storage, um, you know, sort of as a barn over the years. Uh, it was cleaned out at one point for one of the riders on the property to live in. But um, there's an upstairs, and, um, and she said she wouldn't mind doing it. And so um, John Henry, who the third or something, um, immediately went out and bought some 
some plywood, some Kentucky hardwood, and um, they were four by eight sheets. And she started doing these paintings. Francois was very instrumental in the design and layout of the paintings because she always worked small. She, would, she was someone who, once she started creating, really had to create. She, um, she would paint on bottles and shingles and um, scraps. She also made some quilts. And um, so she, um, she agreed to do these murals. She was um, 67 at that point. She'd been painting since 1938. And, um, and it, in six weeks, she did these paintings. Um, she decided after the first one that she said, I don't want to do this for nothing, and she wanted to be paid. But Mr. Henry said he had, you know, he depleted his budget in buying the plywood. And so a few local supporters who, um, who were friends of hers um, put a little bit of money in a pot, and I think she got $5 every time she finished one of these big paintings. This is the way that the paintings are installed in Africa House. Um, they go entirely around the room, and... Uh, and their scenes of plantation life. She was a memory painter. She didn't work outside. Um, she worked in her home from, from memory. And, and, and I love it that Tom and Art came up with this term. I think they came up with it, insider artists, because she was painting what she knew. In the case of the, of the African house murals, she was also painting what Francois knew. And um, he actually made up the name of this house. He made up names for a lot of, of the buildings on the property that have stuck, but they're not accurate. African House probably has no relation to Africa, and Yucca House is also a made-up name. But here um, is just one of the, the paintings in the cycle. This is African House, the big house, and um, this is um, Cammie Henry's eldest son, Stephen, who um, is out examining his corn crops. And this is, um, this is supposedly Marie-Thérèse Quanquan, and uh, this is her husband, Thomas Metoyer. And um, Clementine, people that she considered important, um, she would paint big. And I, I think it must have been Francois's influence for her to put these people in the painting. I, I don't imagine they had much direct relation to her life. But this is Cammie Henry here under this little tree. This is, um, this is the Yucca House, which was used as a residence. And this is a, a great big sundial on the property. This is one of the visiting artists who was a woman photographer. Uh, this, is, um, this is Francois holding a commem commemorative plate that he designed. And this is Clementine serving uh, drinks. These paintings are painted directly on the plywood. There's no priming. Um, there are a couple of people tried to influence her. You know, you have to, you have to prime the wood. You have to varnish it on both sides. And she, um, she just started painting directly on the wood. Uh, this is a baptism scene. And one thing that's so wonderful, I think, about these paintings is that there's just so much flow and repetition and um, and and beauty in the design. Uh, I love these. Uh, apparently, when there was a baptism, everyone in the congregation wore white, so they would all sort of be at the same level. Um, and this, uh, this woman, her, her daughters are getting baptized. And apparently, the story goes that although she was a God-fearing woman, she got a little bit jealous of the attention they were getting. And so she jumped in the water, um, acting like she'd found God or something. And someone yelled, watch out for that water moccasin. And apparently, she just, she got God and jumped right out of there. Then another a local was looking at this painting one time, and he said, well, I wonder if them two ladies is, is the sisters of Jesus, because they're walking on water. <laughs> but it's really, it was really interesting to look at these things and think about this as an artist who always painted small, and to see, you know, how successful she was going to a really much larger format. That can be really difficult for an artist. This is a funeral, Cane River funeral. Um, this is uh, Aunt Addie, who was about 100 years old, and uh, she always drove the funeral trucks, and everyone has on their finery. This, this must be a really important gentleman back in the background who's ringing the bell. 
and this is cotton picking. Um, there was a revival going on in the church, and, um, and these folks are picking cotton. This is the postmaster. I, can, I don't know if the postmaster would have figured very largely in her life. Um, Clementine was never taught to read or write. Um, she didn't have the opportunity, although she was a very bright person. Um, she told Francois once that it was really harder to mark a picture than it was to pick cotton, that she really liked picking cotton. They would sing all day. They would hang their babies in little hammocks in the trees, and they'd get to the end of a row and check on the children. And I think it was just probably a time where she got to be with people that she really liked and, and be in a community that was maybe more welcoming than, you know, being a servant in a house of people where you might be invisible. Um, these folks are, are tending vegetables, and there's a wedding going on. And uh, if it was a preacher she liked, she paint them big, painted them big, but this was a preacher she didn't care very much about. But I like it how the bride is so much bigger than the husband. I mean, women did a lot of the work and figured more prominently in her life, I think, her daily life. And this is um, a pictorial map that um, Francois asked her to do from this plate that he designed. And uh, he wrote an article about her, or wrote an entry in his journal that, you know, showed that she was a, a true primitive because she didn't get it absolutely right. These were the, the crops, the cotton and the pecans, and she only put one pecan. But um, still, they're wonderful paintings. And I don't know if you could see in some of the earlier images, but there are streaks throughout the, throughout the paintings. Um, early on, someone said, you know, these things really have to be varnished. And they were varnished with um, a material, we don't know what it is, but it turned dark brown right away and um, is completely insoluble. So it's been there for a long time. So um, these are just some details. I, I mean, the paintings are just so charming. This guy is knocking pecans out of a tree, and this woman is picking them up. Um, this is Mr. Henry on his horse. Um, this is uh, Clementine painting. Actually, we've been told this is Alberta Kinsey painting, but she painted, painted her as a black woman. And here is um, a cart full of cotton. And um, a lot of the paint is very thinly applied, but the cotton and the flowers are always really thick and have a lot of impasto. I think those are things that she liked. This is from the, the baptism panel. This is the self-portrait that she included. Although she's not known to have ever painted outside, she uh, took a little artistic license on that one. What? what? Sorry. This guy? Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, these are tissue. So these um, paintings were painted in 1955. Um, by 1983, um, it was noted that there were some changes and some flaking. And um, Michael Swicklick and Jay Kruger, who are both working at the Kimball, um, were invited to come and look at the paintings, and they made a proposal. And uh, the following summer, they came and treated all nine paintings, uh, three overdoors, and three other large paintings on the property in uh, two weeks. Um, it involved cleaning. Um, this is their treatment report, which you can't read, but um, it involved cleaning and consolidation uh, and revarnishing the, the image side with a reversible varnish and the back side with polyurethane to seal the paintings because there is some value in having a piece of wood treated the same on the front and back. It can slow down warping and things like that. This um, little picture here, um, while they were there one day, Clementine Hunter showed up and they were just so delighted. She had on a really beautiful dress and she hadn't been over to see her paintings in 17 years, which I think is pretty powerful. Um, the property was sold in 1970. Um, the, the family had, you know, I just think there wasn't much 
um, money in it, and there was a big auction, and almost everything, the contents of art and furniture were sold, but there was a big outcry in the community, and people came and saved the murals in African House from being sold, and they, and they saved these three other big paintings. So, um, 30 years later, um, 60 years after they were painted, um, the, they were in need of retreatment. Um, Michael Swicklick went and looked at the paintings in 2012. He actually um, gave a presentation at, at, the, at the last uh, Divine Disorder Conference. And um, the paintings were, you know, at first blush of looking at, at paintings that live in a, an unclimatized environment. There's no air conditioning. There are no screens on the windows. Um, it's a very humid place where it rains a lot, and it gets cold in the winter. And um, so, so we went and, and did some testing and, and looked at the pieces and came up with a proposal. And, um, and then in May, we went back with um, a team of art movers from Houston, and we started to take the paintings down um, for them to be treated in Houston. They wanted us to do it on site, and we just said, you know, these things really need massive treatment. We need the good light and materials um, and equipment in our studio, and so we finally um, convinced them that that was the best way to go. Uh, when we took them down, there was just a lot of spiders, and um, the wood behind the paintings is um, this remarkable hand-hewn cypress. These boards are, you know, 12 to 14 inches wide and really long and just beautiful, um, but there's knot holes and cracks and obviously lots of insects come in um, behind the painting. So the first thing we did was vacuum them. And, um, and then we had to, we were, you know, we thought, okay, well, we'll put tissue on all the flaking parts. And we ended up putting tissue almost all over all of the paintings because we, we noted so much um, fragile paint. And this is, you can see here what it, what it looked like where the paint was lost. Um, it was tinted, which is where, you know, the paint just comes up off the board. So we used um, sodium carboxymethylcellulose, which is a, a weak adhesive to apply the tissue. And um, we, we dried that with, um, it, was, it was a really kind of wet day, so we had little hair dryers to dry the tissue. And then the, the art movers, um, wrapped the art and put it in a climatized truck and brought it to Houston. And these were the, the main concerns. There was lifting and flaking, um, bird droppings, and um, we saw the spiders, but there were also insect, insect exit holes through the wood, which is um, kind of surprising. Um, the streaky uneven coating um, abrasion from cleaning over the years, lots of variation in the matte and gloss and paint loss. And these are just a few details of the insect exit holes, bird poo, and more flaking. So these are the steps that we did when the, when the paintings came to the studio. We actually photographed them with the tissue on. Um, we consolidated uh, through the tissue with um, fish glue and set the paint down. And then in the process of taking off the tissue, you also clean the paintings. And the, the grime was really red. The, the earth there in Natchitoches is bright red dirt, lots of iron. And um, we, um, we mended the, the plywood. Um, we cleaned the front and back. We, um, there were a lot of articles on the back, and we encapsulated, photographed and encapsulated the articles. Um, the first thing we did was we had them treated for insects in a nitrogen chamber um, at the Museum of Fine Arts. And Steve Pine, who's a cons furniture conservator for Bayou Bend, which is a wonderful, historic, important furniture collection in Houston, said it was actually kind of rare to find insects in plywood. We didn't ever see any insects. It was just a precaution. And... Um, we, um, after we did all the cleaning and consolidation, we filled the insect holes and some of the deeper paint losses and put an isolating varnish of Paraloid B72, which is a very stable varnish. 
uh, we retouched with gambling colors and then put additional varnish on the front and the back um, to make a more uniform surface. Um, this is Gabrielle Dunn, uh, one of the conservators in our studio, and, and she's doing that first step of brushing the sturgeon glue through the tissue. And then it's set down with the little um, hot air tool or, or small tacking iron. Uh, this is a photograph um, that just shows a little bit more about the streakiness that was really pronounced in some areas. And, uh, and this is an ultraviolet photograph that shows the uneven application of the varnish. Some of the paintings actually have a lot of abrasion because it looks like over the years maybe people tried to clean, clean that brown stuff off. So adjacent to a really thick brown line will be an abraded area, which actually exacerbated those differences, those visual differences. Um, and here are two other people on our staff. This is Angela Hadjev and Deanna Hartman, who's here today. She's um, in the process of applying to conservation graduate schools. Um, we've been working on this um, project for almost a year, and we're nearing completion. This is just what the, the paintings look like before and after. This is a painting that hung at the top of the stairs. And as you come up, there's not a railing on one side. And we think the painting may have been touched more. And also, probably humid air comes up the stairs and kind of hits this painting first. So it seemed to have a little bit more problems than some of the others. But the retouching is confined to the areas of loss. And I'm just going to go through um, some before and afters. Uh, this is the African house panel. And this is after treatment. Um, we did do some retouching to um, visually integrate those, those sharp divisions of the brown and the abrasion um, on top of the isolating varnish. This is... It's either mislabeled, yeah. I think this is before treatment, and this is after treatment. And you can just see that, you know, where we did some retouching and resaturating with varnish. Yeah, yeah, I don't, uh, you can see it right here, actually. Thanks, Rob. Um, you can see along the edges, they're protected by a molding. And um, under the molding, the, the layering of the paint was a lot more complex. So you can see that it had both faded and been abraded through cleaning over the years. There aren't any records about this being done. It's just something that probably got done. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I'm not. I'm just not there yet. But you can you can remind me um, before retouching, after retouching. Um, so, a couple of weeks ago, um, probably early February, we had an event at our studio, um, just so people, I mean, so many people in Houston, when they heard that we were working on these paintings, said, oh, can I come see them? And it was really interesting how excited, enthusiastic people were. People who'd heard of her and people who hadn't heard of her were also, you know, pretty involved in a folk art group with the Orange Show and the Beer Can House. And, um, we knew those folks wanted to see it. So um, we lined them up on the easels, and a friend took this panoramic photo. And um, I was delighted that Tommy Whitehead joined us that evening. And this is Tom um, regaling us with stories. He's the most amazing storyteller. And uh, fact or fiction, they're, they're delightful. And uh, 75 people came, including our, our colleague Nancy Ravenel, who was in from the Shelburne on a courier trip. So that was fun. And a couple of weeks ago, um, we went, um, NCPTT sponsored a workshop. It was called Engineering for Timber Framing. And they had um, expert timber framer, um, engineers, people who'd worked on historic building preservation projects, and some, um, some students from the Texas Conservation Corps, which is sort of, I think, like AmeriCorps for Texas. And... Um, people that work um, at, at the local national parks. Melrose is a, is a national historic landmark now. 
and um, is owned by um, a foundation um, called the ANPH. No, A A N P H. A P H N. The Association for the Preservation of Natchitoches Heritage, Historic Natchitoches. Okay, so we ha we went to this workshop. We thought it was going to be sort of like a charrette, and there were charrette aspects. We wanted to go to talk to these people because the building, Af African House, where the paintings have lived, is going to be remodeled. I mean, it's going to be conserved, restored, and rehabilitated, which were the three terms that the, the timber framers use. And um, so we went around and we looked at other historic buildings, and, you know, the joinery and, you know, how you tell if something's authentically old and uh, this is a really old cotton gin on a, on a one of the national park properties. This is the oldest post in the ground building or the largest and oldest building of this kind. It was built in 1790 and it's made with um, something called bousillage. The posts go into the ground. The, the walls are made with mud and um, Spanish moss and little little boards that um, hold it all together. And um, I mean, this building was made as temporary housing in 1790 and it's still there and it has a dirt floor. And it's just kind of incredible that a lot of these really old buildings have survived. This is the kitchen of, um, of that house. And this is, um, then we went back to African House taking all that we learned about looking at old buildings African House is 200 years old, and, um, and we started to notice why the roof was doing what it was doing. At first, everybody just looked, and um, this big, long supporting beam that shows holds the longest side of the roof has a split in it. Um, some of these posts have insect damage, and um, we, we were looking at this really interesting joinery of the dovetail joints of these amazing hand-hewn boards. And we notice that there's a Roman numeral system going up the side. The, the boards are numbered. And we also notice that, that two numbers were missing at the top of each side. And we're, we were just all trying to figure out, you know, what's happened to this building? Um, it's kind of unusual in that the bottom is made of brick, which would have been kind of a more expensive and labor-intensive material, maybe save for a little bit fancier buildings. The bottom of this house is is brick where most of the other buildings of this era are bousillage, bousillage is how they say it. This is bousillage in Yucca House. They have an open wall, so you can see this amazing um, technique. And this is the downstairs of African House. Um, this brick floor was put in a few years ago when um, some repair work was done on the wall. Some, there was excavation and concrete was put underneath. Um, for better or worse, um, that was done. But there's some evidence that this floor, which was formerly just dirt, may be impeding uh, humidification and that moisture may stay inside longer than it used to and seep up the walls. There's all kinds of problems with the with salts and the, the bricks falling. So we talked about all these things. It was really interesting. And, and part of the discussion for us was, you know, am I going over a little bit? Okay. Um, how do we um, rehabilitate this building so it's a little bit safer place for the paintings? You know, what can we do to make it a little bit safer place for the paintings? And, you know, part of it is put screens in the windows and, you know, put doormats down on the floor so not so much dirt gets, you know, tracked inside. Maybe, maybe close this door and have the public enter this way and then go up the stairs so you don't have humidity and temperature change sweeping up. Um, both flights of stairs. Um, in the last year, some reproductions were made by um, a local company. These are the reproductions. And aside from being shiny and smooth, they're, they're kind of remarkable. Um, and the, the idea is, um, oh, I'll tell you in a second. This is the, the wonderful woman who actually funded this project. She died just a few weeks ago, Theodosia um, Nolan, and um, anyway, we thank her. This is where the paintings are going to go live when they get picked up in next week. They're going to go live in the new um, Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame, 
which is a, an award-winning building built in the historic section of Natchitoches um, that's really quite different from where they've lived all this time. And so um, one question I just want to kind of leave with you because, you know, one thing we think about is the cycle of conservation, that these things were restored 30 years ago. Now they've been conserved again. Um, you know, what, what is... What are the concerns about leaving it in this building? And, you know, I think everybody at Melrose, most of the people at Melrose want to keep them there. I mean, it's a symbiotic relationship. The importance that Clementine Hunter's history lends to Melrose and, and vice versa. It's, it's an amazing, compelling story. So um, I don't know. That's one thing. If we have any time for discussion today or tomorrow, we would like to talk about um, the paintings have a lot of meaning, of course, at Melrose. So I just want to thank our staff and um, the folks from Melrose and the authors of um, the books who've been such a help to us, um, the foundation, and, and um, Deanna, who helped with this talk. Thank you very much. Um, here's a little bibliography. Thank you very much.